No one makes money when you're off your phone. They make money when you're on your phone. They can advertise to you. We're just in this constant state of overstimulation. The more time you spend offline, the more you crave time offline. If you're happy, you actually are smarter. And I certainly felt that coming out from this retreat from Unplugged. Why cabins are interesting is they have sex appeal. If you really want to affect change, then you need to make a solution that's sexier than the alternative. But people who have been for a three night digital detox are much more likely to challenge the way that a company uses email than, than people who haven't. I would sign up to a company with this benefit for sure. <laughs> you will have much smarter employees coming back after that. But the other thing that might happen is that they might realize that they're in the wrong place altogether, <laughs> which means that yeah. they are more likely to potentially leave. What's your response to that? If that is your company, then... Quick question. When did you discover that you're a leader? that your actions matter to those that look up to you. You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening, and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Hector, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you for having me. So good to have you on the show. I was really excited to have you here because in January, my husband made a gift for me, which is, was it three nights in a cabin in the middle of nowhere, I had no idea where it was, and completely by myself off the grid with no mobile phone, no internet connection. And I have you to thank for that <laughs> because you're the co-founder of Unplugged. And it literally changed my perspective on myself, my work, the world. Before I keep going on and on about my experience, would love to hear the story of how you came to start Unplugged and what is the problem that you were trying to solve? Yeah, for sure. So it came from uh, me and my co-founder used to work together for a tech startup. We were the first two employees on the commercial side. And then we did the whole, you know, high growth, international expansion, opened offices in the US and Australia. And in 2019, I just started to get burnt out with it all. You know, I was flying around the world to set up these offices, spending all day on my phone. And uh, just, I, I guess, didn't really find meaning in what I was doing. So at the recommendation of a friend, I went to a silent retreat in the Himalayas in September 2019. And that was this Buddhist temple on top of a mountain. And the best thing about that is when you get there, they take your phone off you and you just spend 10 days cut off from the outside world. How did you feel about your phone being taken away then? <laughs> Well, to be fair, by the time I got there, I was I was I was ready for You're ready, it. Like, yeah, I when when it first got suggested to me, I kind of laughed it off. I was like, I can't do that. You know, what would what would the people at work think? All of the the classic. But then, in the end, I was like, I just need a break. So by the time I got out there, I was really ready for it, um, and I found it incredibly liberating. I mean, you you know, I look back at it now as, as such a positive experience. But I remember you really go through the whole roller coaster of emotions while you're there. Um, but, but yeah, so, so very cliche, but I came back from that, quit my job a week later, uh, and that was off the back of a conversation with Ben. So he's my co-founder and we, he'd left the startup at that point, but we'd stayed friends and he is not the kind of guy you'd find at a silent retreat anytime soon. We spoke about how there's a lot of stigma around retreats and meditation and so much of the benefit is just getting people offline and into nature. So we'd heard about this tiny house movement in other countries. And again, had, had just been you know, reading and thinking about 
for space and, and digital detoxing. And the problem with that space is uh, that there's very little innovation there. You know, it, it's obviously super early in a, in a problem that's only going to grow and grow and grow. Like the, the more time we spend online, the more time we can benefit from from being offline. Uh, but you know, there's little innovation there because no one makes money when you're off your phone. They make money when you're on your phone. They can advertise to you. So as a result, it's really only consultants running corporate workshops. And why cabins are interesting is, for, for lack of a better phrase, they have sex appeal. And very much like Tesla has done for electric cars, if you really want to affect change, then you need to make a solution that's sexier than the alternative. And you, you really need to make people want to come and do this. So this was end of 2019, just before the, the pandemic and the world changed. And yeah, we, we thought we'd give it a go. So when you're talking about spending time online and spending more time on the phone, is that the insight that you got from the tech company that you were working on? Because, you know, a bit of context, when I was at the cabin, there were quite a lot of books that I managed to read in the mm -hmm. relatively short time that I was there. And one of them was talking about how technology is literally just sort of you know sucking our attention and our focus is was that did that come from your experience there is that did you experience that yourself and how you were building tech so no our, our tech was it was a restaurant point of sale system or coffee shop so you know basically if you go into a cafe or restaurant they use an ipad for the till so, so not not quite connected mm -hmm. um but I think it was just that busy life that's, you know, associated with even just living in London in your 20s. Uh, I think I, I probably, I probably wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't that comfortable in myself at that stage. And I think I, I probably compensated, tried to fill a void by, by just being busier and busier and throwing myself into work and socializing and whatever it is. So I had this real dissatisfaction with life. Um, but, you know, I, and through that, I, I just started to uh, develop um, a somewhat of a dislike of my phone. I mean, you know, phones are fantastically useful, but everyone you speak to you know, also kind of hates their phone. Um, and uh, th that really started to happen. Read a few books around it. So there's one called Digital Minimalism by a guy called Cal Newport. And it just talks about, you know, how um, spending, sp how much joy there is in spending less time online. Uh, and so I think, as you said earlier, that the key word is change of perspective. And, you know, that, that really started that for me. And then the Himalayas was just a huge eye opener at, uh, yeah, at kind of what's possible when you step away from the noise. Yeah. I mean, for sure, when I was there spending sort of three uninterrupted nights, first of all, away from kids <laughs> and secondly, away from looking at your phone and I didn't put my phone in the lockbox that you provide because my thinking was, well, I'm going to have to reintegrate with the real world. So I almost need to start on working how to work with technology. Yeah. So almost like building that muscle of not going and not using it. And my experience was I didn't use the Internet. I did not surf the web. I did not go look at any social media. I did WhatsApp my family and listen to their sort of voice messages. But what was really interesting, well, there was a moment when I was stopping using the WhatsApp and my fingers immediately <laughs> went to open the apps in that yeah, sequence yeah, yeah. that I would do it. And I just managed to catch myself. And I'm thinking, I'm not thinking about this. This is just automatically happening. And, you know, okay, I managed to catch myself because, you know, I have been... So pr preparing for this moment to not be using my phone. So I was already sort of setting myself up for not doing that and how difficult it is. And in that moment, I managed to catch myself. But since coming back, and this is something I'd like to talk to you a little bit later about it. I haven't been able to kind of maintain that. It's just how much this habit of spending online on your phone is like is infiltrating you there's a real kind of shock when you when you get back into society you're almost kind of jolted back I cried did you really I did <laughs> no I really did because I came back and I was so zen and I went to see a friend that was really nice she was very stressed I wasn't but I was really feeling it from her and then when I came back 
And I gave myself the first day, it was sort of calm. The next day, like getting kids ready for school, you know, looking at all the emails, like having to deal with all so many things at the same time. And halfway through, I cried. Yeah. I was like, my life is nothing like <laughs> this world that I just came back from. And yeah, I have to make changes. I have to change the way I live day to day. Well, that that's the key because mm. what happens, like, how we see this is your first you know, experience with us when you come and do a digital detox for many people, it's the first time, you know, they've spent a whole day or three, three nights off their phone. Uh, it's really there about a, a shift in perspective. And it's, it's to realize, you know, exactly what your relationship with your phone is, because I think it's so easy just to just to not realize what's going on. And, you know, we are so such a cliche, but controlled by our devices these days. Um, and so what happens when you come and stay and when you come and spend that time offline, is is you get some perspective on your own life and you kind of realize what's going on and so then when you go back to your life you actually feel more addicted because because you're noticing it more right like you're not any more addicted but you're noticing it more so it feels even worse at first but what we found is that the more time you spend offline the more you crave time offline mm. so it's really what we're doing is we're helping people get the momentum going in another direction. So you come and stay with us once, you know, we get lots of people coming on their own, we get lots of couples, and then you go back and you say, hey, maybe it's a big shock at first, and then it's like, okay, how can we, what, what's something we can do? Um, you know, maybe a couple might go to a restaurant one night a week and leave their phones at home. It's as simple as, you know, going out for a half an hour walk and leaving your phone behind. So it's the start of a you know, a journey that will last the rest of your life. It's but. interesting because I haven't really connected that. Now you say that, that makes sense because I actually stop watching as much Netflix and the shows that I do watch, they have to be so good to justify watching it. So I really have to, like, like this is really either really brilliant, really good, or it's actually adding something. And also craving the time away from the city. That's it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it, what it does, it plants a seed in the back of your mind. So then your subconscious is seeking out opportunities mm. to, to, to kind of feel like that again, to, to get that sense of calm. So like even mm -hmm. us talking today is, is, you know, you kind of wanting to find out more about switching off and, and it, it, only, it only compounds. So you're on the right track. It's made me read more books as well. Yeah. So yeah. instead of watching that Netflix, is actually, what can I read? And you had amazing selection of books. <laughs> Honestly, like, I just feel like you've recommended a book earlier, and I'm going to look at that. And yeah, just really, really enjoyed that. And I guess it's almost like being a fish in the water, not realizing yeah. that you're in it. And going away and taking that step away and realizing, wait a second, like... What has my life become? Because I'm not really super productive. I don't feel amazing. And I'm just spending so much time f consuming content that is pushing on my triggers or making me feel inadequate or making me spend money on the things that I don't need to spend. Actually, again, that's another thing. I went and I redid my budget. Very good. Yeah. So that made me think, where do I actually want to spend my money? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's a ripple effect. You're so right. It is, yeah. And what we've cause we also had um, a couple of universities do some research and tested kind of fifty people who came to stay at our cabins, and th they did they took quantitative data, so you know tracking tracking your stress levels, etc., and uh, also qualitative data. And what they found on the qualitative side is that almost the biggest benefit is people have the space to realize what they need to change. So you know, for example, whenever I do time offline with myself or my partner always I come out of it and I'm like why am I so busy you know yeah. like I just let's why don't I try being less busy for a few weeks and as you say over time you kind of uh, you, you, you know life happens and, and and you get back into it um but I think again it, it just means that you're then seeking that that chance to reset because you know screens are here and to stay and they, they do bring so much benefit but I think to really thrive in this world um, you know, you, you really need that just just sense of state of calm. Um, and we are designed to live in that state of calm. But what happens is now that we have 
so much information so readily available, then as soon as you pick up your phone in the morning to the last thing at night, we're just in this constant state of overstimulation because, you know, we're never really more than mm. go more than a few minutes without checking a phone or, or checking a notification, etc. And that just means that we're never you know, we never have our full attention. We're, we're living in this like constant state of a st distraction. And what that means is it just makes us more anxious. It, it kind of frays our nerves a little bit more and uh, reduces concentration. So I mean, reading's a, a huge thing where, you know, a lot of people or, you know, most of us just struggle to get through a page of a book now because we're used to this kind of instant gratification. And, you know, reading is like a muscle. And the good thing about reading, I love uh, reading kind of paper books is that you, you, you have to be kind of fully present with that and so it teaches you to you know concentrate so I've started reading more and more in the last three or four years and I've gradually felt my concentration get better over that time I remember you know early 20s late teens my concentration was shocking but you can retrain it but again like if we're training it all day just to flick through TikTok videos then you know of course it's going to go down it's so true. I mean, I when I read, the first, especially if I'm very stressed, the first few pages, I'm like, I have to yeah. keep constantly going back, rereading. I don't know what, it, like, you're almost like so anxious, you're, you're impatient with it because you want to just get to the point, like, give me yeah. the stuff straight away. <laughs> and after a while, it's like your whole body changes and all of a sudden it's like, I feel happy. Like, yeah. I'm there, like, sitting, calm, you know, probably have to give it, especially if you're really busy, you probably need to give it like at least an hour just to even get started. And then after that, I was like, oh, wait a second. Like something has physically changed inside my body. We're trying to go as quickly as the machines as opposed to honoring our biology and going with our own rhythms and being in touch with ourselves, being in touch with our bodies and our brains. And we're forgetting how to do that because machines are like, faster quicker you know we're going through a technological shift you know like this is the this is the latest one in the last 20 30 years as it's moved towards digital and we obviously have been through many as a species before so time and you know when we we started to track time in mechanical units we started to see time differently and it's the same with the written word so you know before that we had a completely oral culture and what's interesting is socrates the the greek philosopher was very against the written word because he thought if we move to the written word, then all of the, the benefits of an oral culture will be lost. So in his view, an oral culture, you know, promoted virtue more and memory and, you know, our ability to articulate ourselves. And, uh, you know, obviously we were just talking, we were just singing the praises of reading. So we're, we're, we're both fans, but perhaps he was right. And perhaps things did change. So I think the, the interesting analogy for me is, um, I, I don't know if you've read Sapiens by, um, anyway, great book. I'm, I'm going to butcher his name, so I won't, I won't say the author. <laughs> um, fantastic book, you know, about the kind of history of humanity. And what he talks about is how the advent of farming is the worst thing that ever happened to us. Because prior to farming, we lived the life of a hunter-gatherer. And, you know, we spent all day exercising and, and roaming around hunting and gathering. We ate a varied diet. We lived in small tribes of up to 150 people. So, you know, you knew everyone. It was a very healthy lifestyle and we were happy. And then, you know, we realized that, hey, actually, we wouldn't have to travel around so much if we could grow our own food. So we tamed certain crops and started settling in communities. And what this meant is that because we had more control of our food supply we could live in bigger and bigger communities and then you get villages and you know over the the centuries and millenniums towns and cities and what that meant is that suddenly we're eating a much less varied diet because you know wheat for example becomes a staple we're living in bigger communities where we don't know everyone um anymore so we're more isolated and, you know, there's disease, plague, we're exercising less, everything. And, and it's hard work, you know, farming is, is hard work. And so I think there are all these interesting technological advances that, you know, make things easier or more frictionless, but don't necessarily make us happier as a species. So I, I think it's the same here, you know, like, like the written word, there will be benefits from moving towards a screen, um, you know, a society where screens are a huge part of our 
our day. But, you know, things will be lost. And I think we're in this interesting transition period now um, where, you know, we're just we're just starting to kind of see it's almost a social experiment that's been running for, for t 10 to 20 years. And we're just starting to see the effects in that. So I think what does that mean for us? You know, as we move towards a society where screens are, you know, such a big part of our lives, then there's always going to be the need or, or the, the benefit of kind of unplugging and, and spending that, that time offline. Just like, you know, comparing farming and, and hunting and gathering, you have people today, hunter-gatherers, these native tribes, and they're probably the happiest people on earth right now. You know, mm -hmm. studies have, have been done about them and, you know, they're fulfilled, they're happy, they're healthy. So in a society where we do spend more and more time online, then there's always going to be a huge benefit to seeking that time offline, which is why we, we want to help as many people as possible develop that muscle, basically. So what are your thoughts on the metaverse? Yeah. Because I feel like we're heading further and further into the world of, you know, living our entire lives on screen, online, or somewhere that is not the real natural world. What are your thoughts on that? Like, is that the worst thing that can happen to humanity? No, I think, I mean, th there's obviously many different use cases for the metaverse. And I think, you know, at, at time of recording, there's a potential conversation that that might not be the right bet by Facebook and AI was the, the thing all along. So, you know, do we end up in a dystopian world where everyone puts on their VR goggles in the morning and, and goes into the metaverse? Uh, I don't think so. I, I think it will probably serve some niche purposes very well. Like there are clearly things, you know, where it does make a lot of sense. I mean, gaming is a is a big one. Um, but I, yeah, I, I just can't see can't see it replacing. You know, as you as you said earlier, um, you know, we are biologically built to be out in the real world, and you know. I heard Facebook talking about how Mark Zuckerberg, how the next step is to be able to make eye contact in the metaverse. And they want, mm. they want to tick off all the different things. Um, but, you know, you can get all those things. You can just go outside and, and meet people. So I think the metaverse has a very long way to go. And there's a good chance it ends up just as, you know, hitting a few niches rather than being the next step for humanity. Mm. And um, I hope that's right because, yeah, I for one would not want to live in, in that world where we're no. all putting on our goggles in the morning. but um, No, especially having experienced of actually being so fully present and so happy. I was like, I had nobody there. I was listening to the radio. I was cooking myself breakfast, looking out the window, and I was like dancing on my own for the first time in ages. And I just like, <laughs> felt so light and so happy. Like things were just so clear in my mind. And... I don't feel like that day to day. Yeah, Th this is the thing. I think people underestimate how malleable the future is. And so the truth is anything's possible, right? Mm -hmm. We could go down any of these paths. Like we feel like the way things worked out was the way they were always going to work out. Yeah. But quite often it comes down to, you know, the, the future is shaped by, you know, how we all act in small groups of individuals. And so unplugged take unplugged as, as one small example you know if we can succeed and if we can get to the stage where we have you know thousands of properties and we have hundreds of thousands or millions of people taking this time offline every six to 12 months then that will move the future in a different direction and more people will experience exactly what you just said and you know more people won't want to put on their vr headset in the morning so i think uh there's yeah i i think we we can definitely move it in a positive direction it, it it builds up momentum as well i think it's super early in this space mm. but there's still very little happening happening in it but i think you know we'll, we'll keep plugging away it's a no pun intended it's a long it's a long game so um yeah yes. i just want to keep doing and what who, i'm doing who do you think your business benefits the most it's a great question um i think I think it, it benefits the most the people who have not experienced something like this, you know, I think. We, to we complete get, newbies. Complete, yeah, yeah, to mm -hmm. some extent, because, for example, I've done these sign-up retreats, such, I love staying in our cabins, it's a great experience for me um, still, but, you know, 
those kind of people who are already going and doing these, they're always going to do them. Um, you know, they're always going to go and do sign up retreats or stay in remote locations, etc. So I think it's about how can we get as many people as possible onto that journey and then support them along that way. So definitely people who are interested in you know their own kind of self development, which I, I guess is everyone it's to some extent, but you know some people are a lot more kind of trapped in their ways than others. So I think you know it has to come from you if 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 unplugged is going to work from you. So we we need people who kind of want to you know change and, and, and want a happier life. So but yeah, it's it's a very broad audience because you know everyone is somewhat addicted to their phone. They are for sure. Even if you don't think you are, you really are. Unless you don't own one at all, which yeah. is quite, actually you no know one person who doesn't have <laughs> a you know a smartphone and. They seem they seem very happy. <laughs> um, and what is your biggest challenge for Unplugged now? Uh, it's just it's really a momentum thing. Like as I said, we are we are very early, so it's it's just kind of pulling all the the various elements of a business, like you know more cabins, keep expanding, get the word out, all, all of these things. So I, th I think it's that you know, a lot of people kind of haven't opened up to this yet. So it's a, yeah, it does feel like it's a long game, but, you know, we're starting to see, especially within a certain demographic in, in London, which is where we started, uh, we're starting to see, you know, kind of people recognizing it and talking about it and telling their friends. So it feels like we're starting to build momentum, but I guess with you know, every startup, you're trying to create a movement, you know, and, it always it always is harder than you think it always takes longer than you think it's like why can't they see what i see <laughs> is that like, it? they don't know what they don't know yeah that's it like i think we have a very kind of clear you know vision of where we want to get but it's just the the mm. bit in between that's the hard bit but no that's we'll true there. one of the things i really liked is the emails that you receive before you go almost like prepping you for you like you know you need to lock your phone away or you know how are you going to feel when you don't have your phone like already anticipating certain things and I really felt that that made it I was like I know what's coming it's almost like a child who needs to be like and now we're going to yeah. put your shoes on and now you're going to go out the door and that really helped not to say that it's the way your marketing is is that it's it's like to, speaking to a child but it felt that you were bit by bit prepared for it and then afterwards although I have to say that I haven't been picking up on the, on the email much <laughs> much to do with what you're preaching Perfect. that's what we want yeah. but also giving some kind of tips of how yeah. to handle reintegrating into real life I have been so stressed in the last week really yeah because I've not been doing any of the things that I have learned and I'm feeling the triggers and I'm feeling the pain, but I'm not doing the things that I was doing before. So and it's it's <laughs> literally manifesting in how my brain just was like, stop, you need to have a little yeah. bit of rest. Um, so when I went into the cabin and I felt so amazing, and as I was saying earlier that on the day that I came back, I was crying. Um, this is just with the realization that actually it's really difficult to integrate that into my day-to-day -day life. And we're now in February and I feel like, I was like, it feels so far away when that trip happened and all of the things that I learned, like how do we, how do we integrate that into our day-to-day -day life? Because at the moment it makes me feel like the whole world needs to change in order for me to at least somehow you know not be the only person trying to like make this change but um yeah how do we how do we keep that going like what what do we do <laughs> tell me i need to know <laughs> well the good news is that the whole world doesn't need to change the, the the best thing i learned at this silent retreat was so it was um it was called intro to buddhism and it was half meditation half buddhist philosophy and the you know i was probably what I would describe as an atheist going in and you know very skeptical of religion so the, the first few days I was like yeah okay fine don't really get it and then mm. halfway through I spoke about the Buddhist idea of attachment and that is the idea that I need this to be happy and the amazing idea there is that we each have everything we need to be happy 
within us and you know it's everything that's on top of that that's getting in the way of our happiness and why that's relevant here is you know it, it sometimes feels like we have to be doing more and it, it's hard especially when you start to kind of recognize how much time we're spending on our devices etc and i think the, the the key thing i found that helps is just being kind to yourself and starting small because especially when you go and do something like uh, an unplugged stay where it is three nights and you know it, it's a you, you go completely offline then when you come back as you say you, you almost feel like a feel like a failure because you're like oh my god i'm still on my phone like this is crazy i'm never going to change but it's just about you know starting small and each day being better than the last and of course you're, you're going to have me too like you're going to have the days but i had I, I, I do keep an eye on my screen time and last week it was like I don't know, 20 minutes a day or something and then yesterday there's just my phone I'm on my laptop a lot more and yesterday I had just a day of lots and lots of screen time just because I was traveling around trying to coordinate things and uh, I kind of beat myself up for it I was like oh my god I spent so much you know I'm trying to run a business promoting this lifestyle and uh, and, and look at me you know I'm, I'm no better than um, no better than I was kind of three years ago but it's you know it's not true and I think it's just being kind to yourself and starting small and then being like okay well look if you're feeling like that you know start by taking an evening off you know this evening just just put your phone away and just spend a few hours offline it's as simple as that like I think we feel like we need to be doing more to solve these things but often it's you know you just need to strip away the things that are bringing us anxiety nothing's ever that urgent yeah, I know, you know, you, you run a business as, as do I, and like, it can, you, you never to be always feel like there's things you should be doing and, and you're not. Um, and I think it's making peace with that and just being like, okay, look, there are all these things, but like, I don't need to do any of them right now and, and just really kind of calming yourself. And I hope this doesn't sound patronizing because I'm sure no, you're not at all. much better at running No, your I business. think it makes sense to, to do things in a small way. And I'm just listening to you and also thinking about what, at which point did I stop remembering all of these things? Because I know it. <laughs> yeah. And I haven't taken an evening off, which has been a problem, which meant that I was trying to squeeze in so much into my day. And it's not so much being on the phone and screen time, but more about, I just want to finish these things. And when I finish them, yeah. then I'll be <laughs> able to take a day off or whatever. Yeah. And And then I just sort of fell into this pattern again and it's like trying to break that pattern has been challenging because it's been set for so long yeah um so yeah it might, it might be as simple as just going for a walk you know w yes walking, haven't made time for that either. walking does wonders <laughs> start there yeah and it's true no it's very true and being a founder of this business like what have you found has been the most difficult thing for you as a founder yeah um I think I think saying no is a is a big one. Like I'm generally a people pleaser. I think a recovering people pleaser. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> you know, and you, I hate to use the word sacrifices because I think you know like anyone who is a founder um, or you know ninety percent of founders get a huge amount of fulfillment in that, myself included. So I wouldn't trade it for the world. But I I do feel like a a deep kind of guilt inside of me um, for you know not getting back to everyone who messages or all of these things it's just and not possible anymore it's not possible but but the, mm. the the crazy thing is that i know intellectually that like they don't really care that much you know like i've there been people in the past um messages in the past and i've been like uh oh, you know beating myself up for not replying and then i'll finally reply after like three weeks or something and then you know like, oh, i'm so sorry it took me so long they're like oh no you know i thought you were just spending time off your phone like that's your your mm. business and you realize that no one really cares, you know, no one's, it almost feels like, you know, if you have a whole bunch of unreplied to messages and, and requests and, you know, people wanting to meet, etc., almost feels like they're spending the whole time thinking, why hasn't Hector replied? But it's just not true, you know? I'm not sure I agree with that. I feel like it's the expectation. So if, say you are in a corporate job and yeah. your boss expects you to respond in 30 minutes or less then if you don't respond for three weeks then obviously there's going to be you know a they're going to care 
as opposed to, you know, you, for example, who is preaching the benefits of <laughs> spending time offline and not being on your email, the expectation as well, you know, you know, he's, he's not even checking his emails because he's living his amazing life. And I don't think that everybody is in the same space. So it's about managing the expectations of how quickly you respond. And I think this whole email response is a problem in itself. And I feel like we as human beings haven't come up with the right etiquette yet yeah. in terms of how to deal with that. And okay, you can put like out of office, but I feel like it just creates more emails to check and to look at. So I feel like as a collective, we should probably spend time on thinking about how we can have less emails yeah. every, rather than more. Every email you send creates more future emails. So yeah. What do you find hardest about being a founder? I think it's, well, you have a co-founder. I find that one of the difficult things is having to make all of the decisions. Like everything rests on you. Yeah. And not having a person who you can be like, oh, hey, this is what the issue is. Like having a peer. It's like whatever yeah. you do <laughs> is on you. Like that is your decision. And I think it just probably doesn't really go, go away even if you have founders. Yeah. I think just having the ultimate responsibility, it's like I thrive on that and I like the freedom, but at the same time, it's like the other side of the coin. It's like, well, what the hell do I do? <laughs> or if you're down and you're like feeling really low and like having, like you need somebody to help you pick up that energy and I think that makes a difference. Yeah, there's a good book called Hard Thing About Hard Things, which is, mm. yeah. Maybe, I haven't read it. Would you recommend? But there, there's one bit in that when he, he just talks about how hard it is running a startup, basically. And there's one bit in that when he says that the average ability of a CEO is 21 out of 100, but no one tells CEOs that that's the same CEO, founder, whatever you want to call it, that, you know, by by the nature, you know, we're inevitably, or what's it, we, but founders are going to be bad at 90% of what they're doing because mm. at each stage you have to learn a whole new set of skills. So, you know, we're just drastically, humans are just drastically unsuited for that that whole journey. So it's a, it's a very kind of uh, unique that is and so true. interesting. You have to really go into yourself and figure out what shaped you and what your triggers are mm. because I know where my excessive responsibility taking and wanting to be <laughs> ultimately like in control of it, where that comes from. And whilst it's very useful, and like my therapist said, like, you know, these coping strategies are useful 80% of the time, <laughs> but they are not helpful 20% of the time when you're trying to solve your problems with just one way of working. And as human beings, we're not designed to do anything really in isolation and we need other people around us and that's been a lesson that I've been learning over and over in my life just very slowly yeah <laughs> um so I think having other people to rely on and to work with and to appreciate other people's skills and other people's qualities and trying to see the best in that and not focusing always on what they can't do well. That's been a hard lesson for me. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But um, looking back, I mean, you're very young, but uh, looking back now, what advice would you give your younger self? I think it would be what I said earlier, which is no one really cares, you know. Like we do, uh, I used to care a lot about what people think of, about me uh, that really stopped it's the people pleasing as you people said pleaser, exactly yeah. yeah yeah really stopped post retreat and but you know it never completely goes away right like I think it's a, a very innate uh, human mm. part of the human experience and yeah no one really no one is thinking about you as much as you think they are and I actually find that very empowering so yeah I, I, I wish I told myself that back in the day but then also you know I'm kind of very grateful as you say like everything that's happened to us shapes us. So I think I've, you know, all the failures and fuck ups of the past, and I've managed to pack plenty into my uh, years, have helped kind of shape and for better or worse. 
Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't change anything, but that's that's definitely what I would would go back and say. Mm. So where is this people pleasing? Where does that come from? Yeah, interesting. Um, well, um, these things always come from childhood, don't they? I think uh, I am a twin, and I was probably more the peacekeeping twin in the family. So. I almost, I think I have a, I'm probably quite conflict avoidant just from that, from, from, you know, trying to keep peace in the house. Um, I mean, that's perhaps a little grandiose, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think it was just comes from that. You see that dynamic play out at the kitchen table kind of, you know, every few days or, or so on. And it, it just kind of deep inside, especially people close to me, like when there's conflict, I, I always try and quash it or avoid it. Mm. Um, and I think that probably is linked to people pleasing, which is, I do think, again, I think strength, everything is a strength and a weakness. And on the flip side of that, I do think I have a lot of empathy and, and that's probably what causes the people pleasing because I, um, you know, am fairly tuned in to how others are feeling and I do care and, you know, I, I try and be you know, nice and kind and, and compassionate. Uh, but then, you know, I also feel it if something's off or they don't like something I'm, I've said or, or whatever it is. So I think, as, as you said earlier about, you know, you want 80%, it's 80% good and 20% bad. I think everything is a strength and a weakness. And, you know, in our weaknesses, we find our strengths and in our strengths, we find our weaknesses. So, yeah, I think people pleasing and, and empathy are kind of tied up together and it has its pros and cons. How do you, as a founder, counteract that? Yeah, it's a good question. Or do you? I mean, maybe it's not something that you have done before. Is it something that you think about? Yeah, I think, well, I think the biggest way to counteract your weaknesses, which you said again earlier, is to surround yourself with, with people who, who see things differently um, because you need that different perspective. And if, you know, for example, because where can companies get derailed making bad decisions? And so you, you need counterweights on the decisions you're making and you need different perspectives because you know we're so blind to what's going on around us uh, so much of the time we just see you know kind of very filtered view of the world and so i think surrounding yourself with different um perspectives and different types of people is is very important uh, but i also think you know it's part of making it work as a founder because it is a real lifestyle choice is you've really got to kind of lean into who you are and you've got to kind of really just be, you know, be the founder that you're kind of built to be. It sounds very cliche, but you, you want to kind of very much lean into your strengths and, and kind of, you know, be very aware of your weaknesses and, and, and build your role in the company accordingly. So, yeah, I think it's really important to, as you said earlier, do the work on understanding yourself and understanding where the strengths are and where those weaknesses are. And then, you know, you, you can you can kind of design your day. I'm, I'm very, um, very much certain that 95% of what we do is a complete waste of time, you know, myself included. Like I, I look back at, especially when I was at this previous startup, I was running uh, growth for the last year, not very successfully. And I look back and 95, at least, percent of what I did was an absolute waste of time. And I'm obviously more effective now than I was back then. But still, I reckon... You know, most of what I do during the working week is a is a waste of time, and I think that's just life. There's something called Parkinson's law, which is work expands to fill the time available. So, um, do you think it's that, or do you think just sometimes you don't know what it's going to take to make it work? Because I feel like a lot of life is trial and error, and sometimes, especially early on, we have to do a lot of things to try them to see what works. Or do you think it's we just do things because we think we need to keep busy? I think there's both. I think there's deliberate experimenting, which mm -hmm. is great. And, you know, we're really trying an error. But then I think there's a um, you know, take when I was running growth, the startup, like I had a real insecurity about my ability to do that role. So I compensated by just being busy, you know, and just mm -hmm. trying to do lots of things. And like, actually, the whole thing would have been much more successful if I'd taken a step back right at the beginning and just said, you know, we need to actually go and fix something over here before we do all of these activities over here so i think it's the same um with being a founder which is you're so poorly equipped for so many of the jobs that the temptation is sometimes just to 
you know, wear as a badge of honor the 80 hour work weeks just so that you can feel to yourself like you're doing your, your utmost mm. when actually the best thing for the company might be for you to go and, you know, take time off and, and go and spend three nights in a cabin. Like so many founders say, I don't have the time to take any time off. And then you hear so many others say, that holiday was the best thing I ever did because I realized that, you know, what we're doing is completely wrong. So there's a bit of a, even myself, I kind of, I'm scheduled to go and do a silent retreat on the 15th of March. And it's a retreat 10 days again. First one I've done since the, the one in the Himalayas. And there's one I canceled twice last year. And I know that if I do that, I won't regret it. And it would probably be the best thing for my performance at Unplugged. Um, but I can feel myself being like, you know, there's too much going on to go and do that. Like, you can't go and do that. What is that saying? It's like, if you don't have 15 minutes to meditate, <laughs> you need an hour. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's like the busier you feel, the more time you need to take off. Yeah, exactly. Because you feel like you're on, you're just in a momentum. You're just like, I just need to run faster and then I'll get there as opposed to like, am I running in the right direction? Yeah. And I feel like I'm on that train right now. <laughs> we all are. Um, yeah. But working towards finishing early <laughs> to leave on Friday and come back on Monday and not have to do anything during that time. So somewhat strategic, but maybe, I don't know. I work as a headhunter within fashion, retail, consumer businesses, and I host roundtable breakfast events quite a lot with HR and some of the things that they are talking about is like, well, how do we keep engaged employees? Like, how do we, you know, what can we do to provide some sort of benefits that are not salary specific? So what do you think that could be? Yeah, yeah. Well, we've had some interesting um, kind of learnings on this side of things. So, you know, we had last year a whole bunch of um, companies get in touch and ask if they could offer uh, digital detoxes as an employee benefit. So we have 16 companies now who give each of their employees an unplugged stay a year. And we've, we've obviously had a chat with them and um, I guess just figured out where they're coming from and, and kind of what they want to see in the future. And I think a lot of the problem is, you know, companies talk about balance. A lot of companies have kind of got that as a, as a value now, but it's hard to actually enforce. You know, it's one thing putting a poster up on the wall saying balance, but especially post COVID is the, the blur between, you know, work and home has, has really just kind of disappeared, which is, you know, uh, tricky. And so it just means that people are burning out that they're finding it harder and harder to, to properly switch off. So, so yeah, we've had companies who, you know, want to use this as almost as a message to their employees to say, hey, look, we, we really do value you. Because I think, you know, it, it does, as you said earlier, like the, it does feel like there's an expectation to reply, you know, especially if, if that's the, the culture at the company. And so, uh, you know, just sending out an email saying, hey, we, we, we kind of value balance now doesn't necessarily address that. So I think by sending, you know, people away and being like, look, you're going for a three night digital detox do not do not message get off your phone do not for three respond hours. exactly exactly yeah. um sends a really interesting message and then on top of that it's you know what are, what are all companies want um you know, fundamentally they want their employees to be happy and, and productive for the the selfish reasons of employee retention and, and company performance but also you know everyone wants to be in a, a culture where everyone's happy and and, and present and uh it's everything we've we've spoken about in this conversation which is you know, people are just burnt out, you know, they're anxious, they're, they're kind of struggling. And so I think this, this does fill a really nice gap in terms of it's something where, you know, that can start people off on, on this journey um, that you've been talking about. And, and then having that as an annual benefit means that there's a chance to kind of do it each year. And, and you've got that, you've got that reset. And it also just starts the conversation within the company. Cause it's like, okay, look, we're really serious about this now. And then it's like, okay, how do we want to design our working environment? Exactly what you said, which is like, you know, people who have been for a three night digital detox are much more likely to challenge the way that a company uses email than, than people who haven't. And so I think it just starts to get that into the DNA of the company and it starts the conversation so that people can start optimizing towards something different, which is not no longer response time, but it's like, how do we be 
effective i think i think there's a really interesting difference between effective and efficient which is like efficient is almost how can we get more and more work done and you know send more emails and, and whatever it is how can we do the things we do faster yeah, exactly and you know and to the level of perfection as opposed to are we doing the right things exactly very well yeah yeah exactly i i would sign up to a company with this benefit <laughs> for sure one thing that what the benefit will be is you'll have much more much smarter employees coming back after that because yeah. even my own personal experience was like when i was calmer i could think clearly there wasn't this fear of like oh you know this is not going to work out so i have to do this it was really it's almost like everything just sort of suspended in time like you can always like see the different elements and you can walk through the ideas the concepts like this is not good this is not good actually this is what i need to zero in it's almost like being yeah as i said it's like being suspended and having employees who can come back and bring that level of clarity and that level of certainty to the work is amazing but the other thing that might happen is that they might realize that they're in the wrong place altogether <laughs> which means that yeah. they are more likely to potentially leave what I have my opinion on that, but what are your what's your response to that? Well, I think if that is your company and you find out that's happening, then you need to know, you know, it's like the core, you know, it's like the walls of a house being completely rotten. Like, you know, you can bury your head in the sand and not realize you've got a problem, but fundamentally you've got to start that long, painful road to, you know, building a great culture and a sustainable company. So, so yeah, I think it for some people it might get more painful before it before it gets better we haven't had any um any people quit yet but i'm sure it's only a, a matter of time i think it's better i mean you don't want unmotivated True. employees yeah, being exactly. in your business you just you know they, it's much better that they move on as opposed to trying to like cling on and and yeah it's inevitable yeah i think if people come to that conclusion after three days and then, then you know that would have been in their subconscious and that would have kind of as you say, that would have gone into everything they're doing, you know, like that, that would have uh, really kind of spilled into everything. And, and other people pick that up as well. So as you say, like, if, you know, people who aren't meant to be there decide to move on, then it creates a, you know, a, a happier environment mm. behind as well. What seems impossible to you now, but should you achieve it will change the course of your life or your business? <laughs> That's a good question. Mm. making this global because there is a global need there's we've been going for three years there's still effectively nothing happening in other countries around specifically this digital detoxing um but that's a big leap you know it's a it's a complicated it seems like a very straightforward business you just put a cabin in a you know in the countryside effectively uh but there's there's lots of nuances and complications and as you go into other countries those change so i haven't made that mental leap yet and you know it's we obviously want to get it right in the uk market first but yeah this this really uh should and, and could be everywhere so we'd love to make that happen not not for my sake i mean you know i'd be very happy going and spending the rest of my life in a cabin with a book and mm. <laughs> taking it easy. But I, I do think it's important because I think, um, as I said, the future is malleable and what we do now will define what comes next. And, you know, all of these problems, again, I'm not for one second suggesting that Unplugged is solving climate change, but if people are spending more time offline, they're more present, they're kinder, they're more compassionate, and, you know, they're more likely to turn up better for these serious problems that we are facing as a uh, as a planet so I, I genuinely am very um bullish on kind of the ingenuity of, of humanity so I'm, I'm sure we will solve uh, or get out of our current predicament and, and into the next one but uh but yeah I, I really think that there is a big place for this in the world and i hope we can do it justice mm. i certainly felt much better human being coming out of yeah. that and i think people around me would probably say the same i think when you're calm when you're happy you just you just do good things and you think clearer i think it was one again when one of the books that now confused which one was which because <laughs> i read them in such quick succession 
but it was saying how when we are stressed, we are, I think, 13 IQ points yeah. more dumb. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're happy, you actually are smarter. And I certainly felt that coming out from this retreat from Unplugged. So thank you for that. My pleasure. And thank you for coming on the show. I had so much fun. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What did you discover in this episode? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments on YouTube or reviews on Apple Podcasts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe or follow buttons and I'll see you next week.